It's time for Craig Smokes Off the Radar. All right, welcome to on, uh, Off the Radar, Sick of 365 Radio, taking a look at some stories that are a bit off the usual path. No NBA games for the next three nights. You may or may not have noticed. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk about the finals. Also, not a lot of talk about the finals. Uh, you know, it just kind of depends on, I think, the part of the country that you're in and also probably what you're watching and whatnot because there seems to be some excitement. And then, I don't know, I don't feel like I'm hearing a whole lot about it since it's really gotten underway. And it looked like uh, this, you know, non-Warriors, non-Lakers, non-the-typical-team type of finals was going to be a huge hit. Uh, game 2, the top audience ratings-wise since the NBA went on hiatus 16 months ago, uh, but that quickly came back down for game number three, which averaged still over 9 million viewers on ABC. That was up 51% from Lakers heat in the bubble last October. Mm. If you want to know if fans make a difference, yeah, 51% higher than Lakers and heat. And that's with, you know, LeBron and company in, in a finals, but, um, that's, that's what the bubble factor was. Uh, and that game also did air against Sunday Night Football, so I'm sure that that took a little bit of a toll. But that was the smallest finals audience ever. We well, witnessed that last year. Yeah, the bubble, when I was watching the finals last year, it made me feel like I was watching with the Las Vegas Summer League or something yeah, like that. It, it was just terrible. Where you turn it on, and it wasn't something... Part of the thing is when you turn a game on, even if you're watching in the background, you know something good has happened because you hear the crowd. Yeah. So I, I could be in the kitchen cooking or getting ready, and I've got a game on, and all of a sudden I hear the crowd go nuts, and I turn and look. Well, if I'm watching the finals last year, I, you know, you're know you just kind of hearing... Yeah, just hearing the ball dribble. You know, like and... It's all you're hearing. It's weird. So people... Obviously, like, well, this is boring. I don't want to watch this. I'll, I'll, I'll see what happens tomorrow morning. I, I don't like the way the Bucks bounce back, you know, yeah. and, 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 and with emphatic. Uh, well, uh, well, Giannis is feeling pretty good. Yeah, he is. Yeah. And, you know, they, they did bounce back. That could have been over immediately. And now, you know, you look at the way they play. They beat Phoenix up a little bit and game on. Yeah, now, now it's a, a real series. But uh, it was uh, up higher, as I mentioned, from the bubble last year. Uh, but still down 32% from June of 2019 with before all hell broke loose. That had uh, Raptors-Warriors. Uh, game three was 13 and uh, 13.35 million, so down almost 4.5 million from two years ago and the same time frame. So, you know, you could take TV ratings for what they are or what they're not. I mean, I think they do tell a tale. I'm very confused, though, because there's a lot of shows or a lot of things that people follow, and they look at the TV ratings and they say, oh, well, just everybody's cutting the cord. But that's not always the case, though. I think there is some cord cutting that's the reason for why ratings for certain shows or certain sports are going down, but... You know, there's also some that are going up. And I wonder, too, just how the pandemic kind of changed people's way of thinking as far as what they watch and and all of those types of things. And I'm sure they probably have new methods to quantify streaming and well, how long new... people stream and how to in- integrate yeah. that with time spent watched on your cable box or whatever, your, you know, on your Nielsen box. Yeah, Nielsen's now introducing streaming numbers, and I don't know how they're going to do that. I guess it'd be easier just to read machines like they do with regular Nielsen, but yeah, rather than having it like in one cable box out of 100,000 people or whatever, tracking what you're doing, they're, they, are, they haven't been able to track you know how many people are watching this show on Netflix for how long, and now they're apparently going to be able to do that, so that should be uh, game-changing in its own right. Conor McGregor broke his leg on Saturday night in his big matchup with uh, uh, Dustin Poirier, and already, you know, talk, tra- talking trash, trying to set up a fourth fight. I couldn't possibly care any less because I don't care uh, about Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier part four. That's where I am on this whole deal. And uh, Khabib Nurmagomedov, a former nemesis of Conor McGregor, who embarrassed McGregor and then retired as an undefeated uh, fighter uh, after the passing of his father. He just didn't want to keep, continue on with his fighting career, and Khabib called it quits. They've tried to kind of lure him back out, uh, but he seems to be adamant that he's staying retired, but he did have a con- comment on Conor McGregor and the uh, event on Saturday night. He said, money and fame show who you are. All the time we hear that money and fame change people. No. When money and fame come, these two things show you who you are. And what has he done? He punched an old guy in a bar in 2019. You guys can watch everything he did and understand. It's just like Dustin said. This guy is a bag of S. I saw a lot of tweets try to support him after the injury. How are you going to support this guy? When kids, young generation, watch him watch this sport. If you want to promote your fight, promote. If the MMA community is going to support 
this bad people, this sport is going to go in a bad way. So Khabib Nurmagomedov weighing in on Conor McGregor. And, you know, he's fair to point out the 2019 thing. That was an ugly thing that Conor was involved with. And, you know, I'd love to be like, oh, screw you, Khabib. But, I mean, kind of right. Like, I mean, I think Conor's good for the sport. But, like, as far as the fighter goes, he's lost three of his last four fights. And now we're supposed to get drummed up and excited for the fourth matchup between him and the dude who just clearly beat him in the second fight, was clearly beating him in the third fight before he broke his leg. I don't know. I think the Conor McGregor train's starting to slow down a little bit, guys. Yeah, I do too. And again, I there, there's one sport in which sometimes they don't know how to walk away, and it's all in a ring. Mm-hmm. It's in a ring. It's boxing. It's MMA. It's UFC. UC, whatever. UFC. It's all of They just don't know when to walk away. And I've even seen guys come back. And, and well, I, the reason I think it's sad because, one, it's – People are going to pay to see Conor McGregor pick his nose. They yeah. will. Their people will go. They will. Now, eventually, it gets sad, and that would be sad. Saturday night, he came out with everything he had. It wasn't as if he was just completely overwhelmed. He was in trouble. But, I, you know, the guy gave it everything he possibly could. But now now you worry about his, well, and the, his safety. And one of the things that, you know, the torch has clearly been passed. No. You know, for, yeah. And... and just it like someone at St. George, Pierre, but all these guys I, George, eventually, they, they yeah, have to and, move on. And I do think part of the reason that guys in, 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 the, in the fighting arts, whatever they are, keep coming back is that, you know, to make $25 million oh. a year, Tom Brady has to play 17 games. Yeah. You know, to make $25 million, all that Conor McGregor has to do is show up and break his leg. Well, I mean, you know, and not, so, but I, I said it, but they have to do, they have one or two fights a year. And so the draw of that of like, well, I can do one. I can do one, and you can convince us because you were great. It's like Mike Tyson's fighting again or trying to fight again because someone's going to pay to watch him, and he's going to make money, and he's going to make up for some of the lost money. There's some of the money but he lost. What are the money he didn't? Even guys who still, ha- it's even like, guys who haven't lost money, I think because they make money. It's just the idea of like like a Floyd Mayweather. He hasn't really lost that much money in his life. He's you know, uh, pretty good about money. He just knows that, all right, I'll fight this YouTube star. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to make how much money, you know? I, I, Oscar De La Hoya was going to come back and fight. Or he, I, I, it's, you're right. It's just easy money, and it's hard to turn that down, and not many of you or us would be able to do that if all of a sudden they said, hey, here's 10, 15, 25 million. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Or maybe 50, 50,000. Who's going to say no to that? I mean, yeah. uh, you know, he's got he's richer than Croesus. He doesn't really need the money, but, you know, uh, he does have a big appetite for spending. So <laughs> won't surprise me if we see Conor McGregor again, you know, fighting a YouTube star in a couple of years, um, you know, Poirier for a fourth time or whatever. You know, they're still talking about, like, Diaz again. And it's, you know, to cap off their trilogy. And it's like, man, the last time they fought was, like, four and a half years ago. And, like, what would be the point of that? I mean, so, yeah, you're just, you're, you're in real time watching a fighter who about two and a half, three years ago was the biggest star in the world has now fallen in a very short amount of time uh, pretty far. I mean, as far as just his standing in what actually made him as popular as he was. So uh, there was Khabib Nurmagomedov, who did walk away, retired unbeaten, and did so in his 20s. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how dominant he was. He was one who had no problem walking away. Uh, Roger Federer is not going to be in Tokyo to play for uh, an Olympic medal in a men's singles tennis. He had to withdraw after re-injuring his surgically repaired knee and said during the grass court season he had suffered a setback. So he is withdrawing from the Olympic Games, but wishes the Swiss team the best of luck. So there's one superstar you will not be seeing this summer. And I don't know how many people really pay attention to Olympic tennis. I mean, I know it's got a following, but I'm not sure. I don't feel like I hear those results as much as I hear about gymnastics and track and, and no, everything else. It's, but it's, Yeah, it, it's not. And that was – was that not a late ad? Rec- is, is that a recent thing, tennis? Or am, uh, I, am I missing something? I don't think I, so. No, I think, I think it's in recent that they've gone the – professional route okay. where okay yeah. you know right. but Federer will not be involved uh this was a little bit of history I was here about the first time this happened the first time that happened not not often that you hear that with orthodox jewish athletes uh so i thought this was interesting to mention uh 17 year old jacob steinmetz made history on monday the arizona diamondbacks took him in the third round of the mlb draft he was number 77 overall the first player known at least ever to uh 
be drafted who practice uh who is an Orthodox Jew who practices uh, or, uh, Orthodox Judaism. Uh, so he is the first ever six foot six Long Island native. He is kosher. He observes the Sabbath and all of that. So um, during the sunset on Friday uh, to sunset on Saturday during Sabbath, when he's observing that, he can only walk. You know, you can't do the whole transportation thing. Can't be on a car, bus, train, plane. So that might be a little bit of a problem in Major League Baseball, but maybe they'll have a homestand or something when he eventually gets there, if he ever gets there. But just interesting because... I don't wouldn't have never thought of that, and so yeah, first Orthodox Jewish baseball player uh, drafted, or at least known in uh, in baseball history. That's so. a cool uh, update, by the way, on that Olympic tennis. They did not compete for any medals from 1928 to 1984. Oh, there you go. So it's not like recent, recent started back up in 1988, but it was a 60 year drought of no tennis in the Olympic Games. By the way, uh, one note on Khabib, because uh, they were trying to set up the big, massive pull George St. Pierre back out of retirement again and have him fight Khabib coming out of retirement. And Khabib's like, no, let's just be legends. <laughs> Not even going to fool with it. That guy, I, I do appreciate his just no-nonsense approach to pretty much everything. Uh, with the changing of name, image, likeness, this has led to a lot of people who have been punished for breaking the rules as they were rules back then to now call in for... Uh, people to change those rules uh, as though they were in place when these people got punished for them. Uh, the example I'll give you here is Ohio State, the Tattoo Five. Uh, remember a few years back, yep. Terrell Pryor and four of his teammates under then head coach Jim Tressel got free tattoos. Uh, they were impermissible benefits, but because they were Ohio State football players, they got free tattoo work, which can range in the hundreds of dollars. And so uh, they just gave memorabilia uh, as their payment uh, so jerseys and, and whatnot. Of course, Ohio State uh, actually got in trouble for that, had to vacate some victories, had some NCAA sanctions. Uh, but Pryor and the four players uh, who were involved have come out. Devere Posey was one of them, Solomon Thomas, who's a Texas native, Mike Adam, Daniel Boom Heron. They called for their school records and legacy to be restored so that Buckeye Nation can look at us with the same love and fondness we've always had for them. So these guys were kind of on the outs with Ohio yeah. State's fans. Yeah. Much like probably well, Reggie Bush was to an extent, but, you know, kind of like with Reggie Bush, and I am all for – I think the Heisman thing, to strip him of a Heisman, I did not agree with that. But I also don't agree with saying, okay, well, just because it was uh, – it's okay now doesn't mean it was okay then. So I don't, I don't know. Where yeah. do you guys stand on that? I, I, I'm, uh, with, I, I'm with you. Look, it was against the rules, and they knew it. They broke the rule. Was it, was it a rule that didn't make a lot of sense to a lot of people? Yes. But also, here's the deal – that incident got Jim Tressel fired. Yeah, it did. That incident got Jim Tressel fired because Jim Tressel very foolishly lied about it. Mm -hmm. Instead of just saying, and, and, and I think the, the two lessons from that are, there's a lot of dumb things that happen in college athletics that you shouldn't lie about. And two, uh, nobody's irreplaceable. And I know that that team was really good, but just suspend the five guys and move on. Yeah. Hey, Jim, you're replaceable. We got a guy I, named Urban Meyer. Hey, Urban, you're replaceable. We got a guy named Ryan Day. Yeah. <laughs> it, at the time, it's made them ineligible. There's no reason to strip their names from the athletic department books. It's just stupid. Whenever they do that, any of that to me, I don't care what they've done. I don't care what it is. It's stupid just to say we're retracting them if, completely as it, if they did not play. Yeah. If I ever get the sweet-ass job of – uh, NCAA president, which I think I can handle, uh, honestly. But my first order of business is like, listen, any records that have been vacated, I'm putting them back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're like, we're putting the records back. It's stupid. They're all, that's not vacated. That's how it is. Just deal with it. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see what happens there. We'll see if that gains any traction or not. But certainly Terrell Pryor and the Buckeye Five, uh, as they're being called, are uh, are going to try and get their get their stuff back, so to speak, uh, their their stats and whatnot. And finally, uh, the biggest news: uh, Major God. League Baseball, seven inning double headers uh, and extra innings where you start with a man on second base could be going to the wayside after this year. Rob Manfred told the Baseball Writers Association of America today that he sees them as being innovations specific to the coronavirus pandemic. Of course, they were first adopted last year during the shortened season, and he said that those were uh, implemented based on medical advice and are not being contemplated as permanent. And while the health situ situation has been proved, uh, changes could not be made mid-season, even though a lot of people are now vaccinated. So we'll have the runner starting on second base, for the rest of this year, and we'll have 
uh, the uh, seven inning doubleheaders for the rest of this year, but it sounds like after this year, uh, baseball is going to go back to Thank somewhat I, normal. I, yeah. I mean, I understand change. I understand rules that change, but this is the, that just turned it into like for the, just for like the shortened season. City league softball for the fifty game season, it made a tremendous amount of sense because city league softball doesn't do that. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, I think the, the runner oh, on second, that's, do, what yeah. they, that's what they got the rule from. Yeah. But uh, it made sense for a 50-game season. It, it it made sense maybe to have it in the barrel in case this season wasn't under control. But I, I think that, that now it's it's just got to be over. When we come back, David Hellman, DallasCowboys.com. Cowboys open up training camp. They actually arrive, I think, a week from today. Start on the 21st in Oxnard, California. John McClain and new track and field head coach at Baylor, Michael Ford, in between those two. Paul's top five at 555, and this is Sikkim 365 Radio. From the first workout to the last practice, sports is an incredible challenge.